Hey, Business Building Warrior, it's Jim. Thanks for joining me. We have another episode today with an interview with some successful students. They've actually built a million dollar plus business. They hope to maybe hit 1.5 for the most recent 365 days. They are going to have a huge Q4. They're operating at just around a 20% plus profit margin. And they've only been doing it about a year, seriously, following our replens program. Now, today's guests, it is a mom and a son. Colin, the son, owns the business and his mom, Laura, works with him. They're really the two that have built it up. Now, they've got a little help from dad and from his wife. And they've just hired, like within the last few days, a couple of people to help them start prepping. But this is a business that they've built. And even in spite of a big move, they just moved the whole family. They've been able to just rock it. They've had their... Uh, they said about $4,000 a day is their average right now in total sales at a great profit margin. That's pretty incredible. They're following the replens strategy. They're also recent students of our replen wholesale workshop, which I'll stick a link in the show, na- show notes today as well. The replen wholesale workshop.com is the Rich and Shelley Potter. Remember, I've told you about them. They live out in Phoenix, Arizona. You can go see their whole operation and learn how they operate and how they do things. That's what they did recently. That's given them a boost as well. But the vast majority of their business is hundreds of replan products that they're buying off retail shelves and selling for a great profit using the systems and the tools that we teach around here. Now, you're going to hear them reference a few tools and resources. I'll stick links to all of that in the show notes. So you don't have to take meticulous notes today. Because one of the things I like about today's episode, we really kind of dive into the weeds. I ask Laura, for example, who does most of the sourcing when she goes to stores, what are you looking for? What tools are you using? What are the parameters that you use when you dive into Keepa? If you don't know what Keepa is, something you might want to do is go back and listen to my recent Keepa episode. I'll stick a link to that in the show notes too, where I explain why Keepa is the tool you need to do Amazon right. So when we start talking about some of the Keepa terminology, it'll make a lot more sense to you if you do the prerequisite of listening to the Keepa episode. And again, I'll have a link in the show notes for you there. But if you know what Keepa is, she tells us what she's looking for, what type of graph she's looking for, how many drops, which represents how fast the product is selling. And they dive into how they distinguish winners and losers. And they even talk about some of their losers. They've had losers. We all have losing products. Do we talk about why that's not really a big deal, exactly what to do with them and how you don't have to worry about that as a negative. It's just part of the testing process. You're going to enjoy the family dynamic as well. It's really cool having a a mom and her son on here. And while the the husband, he's out working and his wife is out working as well. Colin's wife is working, but the mom and the son do most of the work together. It's just a cool dynamic. So we dive into that a little bit, the impact of a family working under the same roof on a business it's really fun listening to these guys talk and interact. I think you'll enjoy it with plenty of great specific tips as well and strategies for helping you grow your business. So I'm going to get Colin and Laura on the line right now. Hope you enjoy hanging out with them as much as I did. So Laura and Colin, welcome to the show. Thanks so much great for having to us. Be here. Yeah, we're excited. Great to have you. I, I'm eager to jump into your story. Let's hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the story probably started um, just about two years ago. Um, I I just got a a memory on my phone this week, actually. Um, I quit my job two years ago um, earlier this week um, with the intention to to start selling on Amazon. I really had um, no idea what it would be like or what it would come to. Um, but I, I was just so unhappy, um, working a, at a corporate job. Um, even though I, I was pretty good at it. Uh, I became the top salesman at a uh, pretty large corporation, um, within the first six months of being there, but I just wasn't happy. Um, I always, what knew- were you selling? What were you selling Colin? I'm curious. <laughs> IT conferences, uh, for a company called Gartner. Um, gotcha. so it wasn't glamorous. It wasn't exciting. Um, it, it wasn't where I was supposed to be. Um, yeah, I just, it, it reminds me of selling uh, software licensing. Yeah. I exactly. sold the, which is my last real job. Now it's been, you know, we're coming up on 19 years ago. (laughs) So, but yeah, it just didn't feel right. But I did it longer than you did. So you jumped ship pretty quick, six months in top sales rep. And you jumped ship. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think I quit around the, the eight month mark. I just felt like I'd been there for five years and I it was just so unhappy. Um, so I quit with the intention to start selling on Amazon. And um, obviously I had a ton of conversations with uh, my parents. Uh, obviously my wife was included in that as well. Um, and my dad was kind of weary of, of the idea of quitting a corporate job that was paying well in, in order to yeah. really have a steady income or like necessarily a, a great plan involved. Sure. Um, That's dad's job. Ask you hard questions, right? Yeah, your mom's it, too, right? Exactly. And, but who, and, he, it, and I love that your mom's on the on the episode today with you. That's going to be phenomenal. For those of you who are just listening, uh, it, it's it's Colin's mom, Laura, who's here with him today for the interview, which is super cool. I love you guys are doing the business together. But yeah, keep the story going. Yeah, yeah. So um, obviously, with talks with my parents, um, I was a little nervous about you know the risk involved, um, just because. The only thing I thought was selling on Amazon was private label products. Um, So a little bit more capital was required. Um, That kind of made me nervous. Um, And my parents had finally bought into the idea a bit. Um, My mom was on board the whole time. It took a little convincing. I'm like, go for it. (laughs) Yeah, it took a little convincing. (laughs) That's awesome, mom. Good for you. (laughs) Um, So I I asked if they wanted to um, basically help invest in my company and, and take some ownership. Um, and we became partners because of how much they, they wanted to, to so support me um, in that. Um, and actually the private label stuff was going well. Um, within the first three months, we were selling $10,000 a month um, in revenue. Um, and at private label, the margins are great. Um, the, the money was okay. Obviously now knowing what we know, $10,000 isn't all that much, but it's still exciting to um, get to that that level. Um, and then COVID hit and um, basically shut down our entire business. Um, for whatever reason, Amazon stopped shipping out our products in a timely manner and people stopped buying our, our products. Um, so we went from selling $10,000 a month to two to $3,000 a month during that, that span of time. Um, and this is really where my mom gets involved in, in the business because she was like, hey, like, you know, people are selling groceries on, on Amazon. I'm like, why would anyone buy groceries on Amazon? That's so silly. Um, It is, but they do. (laughs) It's wonderful. Um, It still is. Even though we've got people with incredible businesses, I still like, really? People would, they'll spend $27 on this. You could have gone to Walmart and spent seven. Right. I don't get it. I don't understand. They could have ordered on walmart.com still and and, and got it for the same price, but they don't. They go to Amazon, they spend 27. And And a lot of people do that. But before we get into that part of your story, Colin, yeah. What were you? What was your private label product? Give me as much detail as you can. I don't know if you hope to get back into that niche at some point. Don't give it away, obviously. But what was that product that kind of vanished when COVID hit? Yeah, so we're we're still actually selling it. They're they're picking back up. Um, so I don't want to share too much, but it, it is exactly. in like a, almost an apparel um, clothing or um, okay type product. So gotcha. Okay, but the sales tanked pretty hard when COVID struck. Very, very hard. And, and you were you were thinking, okay, time to diversify. And it was mom's idea. Where'd you get that idea, mom? I'd, I'd like to hear from you, Laura. What's uh... you know, I was listening to the news on things that were in high demand during the COVID time period, and I said, hey, we should look into this. It's kind of in short supply right now. It's in high demand, and so we tested it out on eBay. We started on eBay because we, we need to get ungated in grocery right. on Amazon. So we were selling on eBay for probably about a month while we were getting ungated through Amazon for grocery. And the day we got ungated, we we listed obviously, and we just kept hearing our phone go off. Yeah. <laughs> we were because we were doing FBM at the time, um, selling that one product, and we sold that product for about three months, and it was gangbusters. It was crazy. Yeah, it was insane. Yeah. So if we could have had enough supply of it, um, we so. We were in Florida at the time, so I was driving around to every single Publix, basically in in our area. Um, so I was in the car all day, every day, just trying to find this product. And um, had we gotten enough of it, we could have probably done you know fifty thousand dollars a day. But we would sell out with a matter of you know ten fifteen minutes, and we were doing a couple thousand dollars just like right, that. Right. Um, and then that's that's when we really realized, okay, this this is a real business. How do we do this with other products than just this one? Um, right. So we basically did a $25,000, $30,000 in the first month just with that one product, that one grocery product. And that's what really funded our business into expanding into the the replens model. Um, And that's uh, basically where we've been for the the past year now uh, of just doing replens. 
But then obviously we, we went out last month to Rich Potter's uh, warehouse and learned from him about wholesale. So we're trying to um, do something very similar to him. We're repairing both replens and wholesale into to one business model. Gotcha. That's of course the, uh, I wrote it down. I saw it in your bio and I wrote it down because we've got many different websites around here, but the Replen Wholesale Workshop, yep. replenwholesaleworkshop.com. We'll stick out in the show notes, but that's a chance to go hang out with one of the top students in our community who's become a real leader in Rich and Shelly Potter. They actually presented at our Proven Conference here a couple months ago, did a great job there as well. But yeah, they're doing a lot of wholesale, they have a pretty creative strategy they've dialed in. And you guys went out there and spent four days, saw the warehouse, saw the workshop. What you, did you guys think of it? Let's spend a little time on that. Yeah, I mean, it was great. It was um, great to see a, a bigger operation than us. I think it's always good to look look ahead to see where we want to go. And um, we just felt like we were at that point in our business where we had kind of plateaued um, and wanted to learn how to do resale or do the wholesale model. Um, we also wanted to learn how to palletize and we also wanted to learn how to outsource more effectively. So those were kind of the three things that we went out there to learn. And I felt like we came home very satisfied and yeah. that we learned how to do those three things well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was just implementing it. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> what we've been working on um, ever since getting back from um, the workshop a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're still even digesting the, the content yeah. you were, <laughs> you went through, right? Yeah. Haven't implemented all the good ideas yet. Now, were you, you guys weren't at the conference, were you? In no, we, no. So we were debating between the two, um, the workshop or... Gotcha. Um, yeah, that's a lot of travel time. Yeah, a lot of travel business, so. back. Yeah. back. So, um, we were signed up for the conference. Um, I was a VIP, um, but I guess I'll have to use that next year. <laughs> yeah, you know, it carries over if you didn't make it. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So we'll, we'll do it again. I don't know where we're going to do it next time, but wherever we do, you, it'd be great to have you guys there. Okay, so where did you pick up your replens skills? You built quite a business, replens. Are, are you proven Amazon course students or have you, are you? Okay, I thought you were. I thought I'd seen that you were. Um, so you went through the replens training and the proven Amazon course. Good. And then That's, last, go ahead. Last July, we also did um, Kate Chaddock's um, class, her replen class, her replen mentoring class. And right. I would, that was extremely instrumental in. Um, teaching us how to do replens well yeah. and very motivating to us to actually increase our sourcing methods and get the products that we needed to achieve the numbers that we wanted to achieve. Fantastic. And, that mastermind experience of just hanging out with other people who are doing it at the same time you are challenging each other forward. Yeah, that's a tremendous concept. We love those. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's very good. good. That, that was a great class that we took and um, was really helpful to us. Um, we, you know, through that, learned how to do inventory lab, keep, uh, yep. learned about replan dashboard, um, in, implemented our repricer. So all that all happened kind of last July and kind of got our business structure set up more professionally, I would say. Yep. Yeah. yeah, sure. Sure. I love it. So the, which repricer do you guys use? I'm curious. Uh, we use Aura. Aura. Yeah. Go Aura. Dot com. Yeah. We, that's the one we use as well. A lot of people do. There's a few of them floating around. I was just curious. We'll stick a link to that in the show notes too. I don't think I even have an affiliate link for those guys. We've referred them a lot of business though. They're they're solid for sure. Yeah. Cool. yeah we, we tried Be Cool for a little bit, but Aura just had uh, more capabilities that, that, that we liked. And um, they've added a lot of stuff since we we started using them. So we, we always suggest it to anyone asking yeah. us. It's a good solid tool. Yeah. Okay, so how many replens do you guys have at this point? What's your arsenal look like? Um, it, a lot. Um, <laughs> we're we're probably close to four to five hundred different products or SKUs. So they're they're not. Uh, I mean, Kate taught us like go deep in, in one product if it's working. So um, we have multiple multiple SKUs of of the same product at times. So, um, but yeah, we we probably have on a, any given day probably anywhere between three hundred and fifty to to five hundred active SKUs. That are, that are available to be sold either FBM or FBA. You guys started off doing a lot of merchant fulfill FBM. Sounds like you're doing a lot of FBA now as well. Yeah, we're, we what, pretty much do that exclusively now. Yeah. Um, we, 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 we don't just, like FBA or <laughs> FBM. That, that's not, I don't yeah. know. It, yeah, the great thing us. about FBA is you can work when you want to and when you have the time. With FBM, you're, you know, you're, responsible to get those products out in a timely fashion. And if, you know, if you're away on vacation or 
just busy with other things, it's, it's hard to maintain that schedule yeah. um, at the volume that we're doing. So yeah. we prefer that VA. Yeah. Uh, so how big is the team now? I know, I, I know it's the two of you. Who else? What else is, what else do you have going on? Yeah. So, um, so my wife, my wife has a full-time job, um, but she works remotely. So she has the ability to, to help us out, um, especially in the warehouse when we're our warehouse being our garage. Um, but when she's free, she, she helps out. Uh, my dad also full-time job, but he, he helps out in the warehouse when he can. Um, and then we actually just this week um, hired two 1099 contractors to um, be basically our, our prep center for us. Um, so they'll come over to the garage and um, work a couple hours a day and and prep our products for us. So um, th- that's been super beneficial. It's gotten me out of the prep and pack process to start focusing on, um, you know, finding wholesalers and distributors that I can start to work with. Yeah. Yeah, Colin, I, I have a feeling that you're going to be thinking, man, I should have done that six months ago here <laughs> if you haven't had that thought already. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Even kind of feeling the pain of that, not having help, not having hands in the warehouse yeah. with us. So that's been, um, Great to have them on board. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you? What's the arrangement you guys have with with them? You said it, if, a few hours a week. What What are you paying them, and how long it take to train them? Because I think some people are hesitant to take that step, yeah. and they're coming into your house. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we you're were, still kind of figuring that out. Talk us through all that. We We were hesitant, and we actually they just started last week. Right. So I mean, just a few days in. Refreshed right. us too. Um. So I just I put an ad on. Facebook marketplace in one of the moms, the local moms page and thinking that it would be great for a stay at home mom to come help us for a couple hours in the afternoon. Um, so we do three shipments a week. We do Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from like 1230 to 330. And, um, we're paying them about $15 an hour and we do 1099 employees. So hours are open and they can come if they want, they don't have to come, you know? So it's, It's a really flexible schedule for them and and us and um, yeah. yeah it's been working well so yeah so yeah. far right it's still been yeah. in the experiment stage but I bet you guys will really love it have you considered or not considered having them uh, be able to work from home like come get the stuff take it back home type of you know that type of because that's what Josh Rojas does yeah. right have you heard that episode or seen that model yeah yeah that so we we like to think our our where house process is, is really, really good. Um, so no, we, we haven't done that yet. We just want to have a little bit more control over the quality for mm-hmm. at least the time being. Um, I mean, like for example, yesterday, um, we got a 700 unit shipment out in three hours, um, with, with our employees, which is awesome. Like that's they, phenomenal. They, yeah. So they, they prep three products and they pay for themselves within that hour. Um, but they're yeah. doing a lot more than that. So the return on investment in these employees has uh, been awesome so far. Like like you said, we're brand new to it, but a few uh, days in, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the the return has been uh, phenomenal so far, and um, just because of the way we pe- prep and pack, um, there would be really no way to do it um, from their house. Just um, our process that we have. Yeah, sure, that makes sense. So, h- how many people did you guys talk to before you decided on the the two that you were working with? We had quite a bit of interest um, and I kind of sorted through it. Um, I just said, you know, hey, tell us a little bit about yourself. And based on that, we kind of selected who we wanted to interview. We interviewed three people and um, selected two out of that. Um, but there was a filtering process, obviously. and based Before on, you got to that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the two are really close, you know, physically in our neighborhood here and, um just their schedules worked out. They seemed excited. And that's half the battle is finding people that, you know, want to work and are going to show up for you when you need people to help. So. Yeah. Yeah. That that's great. Had you ever hired anyone before Laura as part of your duties or is this kind of new territory for you? Um, I don't think I've been in the hiring process. I mean, I'm in in my corporate job that I had prior to kids, I would sit in on interviews with my boss. We were hiring somebody within our team, but I, I wasn't ever responsible myself for that. For so. making the final decision, but you've done that before. Just kind of, in, in I think just instinctually, females have a, they can read people so much faster than us guys. Yeah. <laughs> I love when my my wife will come into a relationship that I've had for 
few months, maybe, you know, a business relationship and she'll make an observation after a few minutes. It took me weeks or months to figure out. I'm like, how'd you figure that out so fast? <laughs> she'll see things that I just don't see. So good call, Colin, having your mom yeah. in that part of the biz, man. That's a great call. Your, your wife's input and your mom's input's invaluable. It was, it was my mom they see things. My mom interviewing. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> they, they just see things that we don't, man, as yeah. guys. They just see things. Yeah. So this is awesome. Well, what else? What are we leaving out of your story? This is this is just a really incredible. So we haven't talked numbers yet. I guess we could hit that. Like, where are you guys at? Um, you know, it, it was going pretty well with the private label thing. I guess that's a smaller piece now uh, of your overall pie for sure. So just talk us through some of the numbers that you're comfortable sharing. Yeah, yeah. So um, literally last week, I believe. So um, within a year after taking um, the replens course, we we've hit a million dollars in sales. Um, that's before we hired anyone else. Um, we it was. Basically, my mom and I doing it full time and my wife and my dad um, helping out when they could. Um, so for anyone listening to this, it's possible to make a million dollar business in your garage or in your room. Um, we, we were doing this out of uh, my house in Florida, out of a bedroom. Um, and we were, we were doing $100,000 a month um, out of a bedroom, which is you know crazy to think of a, a million dollar business. You think it has to be some extravagant play and plan, but yeah, you got to have an office and a logo yeah. on the door and all that. Right. Yeah. It, it just takes <laughs> hard work and consistent work. That's, that's really what we've noticed is when, you know, we start lacking in searching for new products, we start to plateau a bit. So then we have to start searching for more products. So, um, we've been really consistent in, um, finding new products just to, you know, expand that base that we have. And then when we find a home run, it's awesome. Um, mm. but yeah, so we, we hit a million dollars, um, two weeks ago, last week or two weeks ago. Um, uh, right now we're averaging about $4,000 a day. Um, we're on pace to have our best month yet. Uh, we're, we're over $80,000 a month or month to date, I think. So yeah. Um, and everyone really talks nice. about, Oh, summer's slow in this business. August is terrible. No, come on. <laughs> you guys are doing $4,000 a day in what's supposed to be the slow time of the year, but it's not. Hey, I've got so many questions. Are you guys doing anything seasonal? Um, not really. No. So you uh, try to find stuff that's nice and steady year round. Yeah. yeah until Christmas. Yeah, we, we, we Some things during Q4 that are Christmas yeah. related. Um, but we, we like to have consistency mm -hmm. in our numbers and the way to do that is to find non-seasonal things. Yeah. Although we do have some things sprinkled in, yeah. but for I, the most part, yeah. no. Obviously if it's going to sell, we're going to buy it and sell yeah. it. Um, sure. but that, that's not the majority of our business. We, we want consistent products that sell year round. And what, so the, the private label, it's a small piece of the pie now, right? Very, very small. It's probably 5% uh, at most of our revenue. Gotcha. It's okay. basically free money at, at this point. I don't have to do anything other than some products. In. Yeah. And when you say finding new replans, what do you guys do? What's your current strategy? Who's good at it? Like who's the expert on the team? That's mom, huh? <laughs> Colin's pointing at mom. We, you know, everybody does that a little bit differently and what they're comfortable with. I'm very comfortable in the store. Um, so we, we do a lot of sourcing in the store. Um, I don't take pictures. Typically I source from the shelf. Um, I don't do it systematically. I, I look for things that are new. I look for things that are unique. Um, uh, things that catch my eye. I don't know. I, I, I guess I just have a sense what's, What's interesting? I don't know. I don't know what it is, but um, yeah. yeah well, as, as, did you do most of the shopping for your family before you got got into this business? Yes. And, and she was a professional shopper for other people too. Yeah. Really? Okay. I I want to I want to spend some time here because we've talked about that that special something that we can't put our finger on. Where and I've I've kind of developed it myself, not to the level that I think some others have for sure, but. If you set me down in, in any store shelf, like I love going to new areas, like on vacation or whatever, walking into a store. You mentioned Publix, for example. We don't have those up here. I live in, you know, I'm in Indiana. You guys are in the South. Florida has Publix. I think what it's a, it's a Georgia, Florida thing, if I remember right. But you know, it's mainly Southern U.S. But I walked through one of those when we were on vacation in Florida, and had my phone with me. And I was supposed to be getting in and out of there in about five, 10 minutes. Family's waiting on me for something. I don't remember what it was. But I, I spent 45 minutes, minutes to an hour. I'm like, oh man, that's a replan. That's a replan. I bet that's one is too, because it's, they just jumped out. Mm -hmm. So what is it, Laura, what do you think that is that makes certain things jump out at you? If you can kind of pinpoint that. 
So, um, bef so before I did Amazon with Colin, I um, worked for a company called Shipped, who um, and they are a service that delivers groceries to to consumers. And I did that full time for two years, and I would do ten to twelve orders a day um, from. 6.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. And I, so that taught me what people are buying. You know, I saw many different customers throughout the week and I saw what was popular. I saw what, what they repeat, bought, you know, bought. Um, so you just got a sense of, you know, what, what was popular, what was needed from somebody in America mm -hmm. um, for their family. And so that, that has helped me. It also made me very familiar with the stores and how they're laid out and, just, you know, what areas are shopped more heavily. So I kind of just know how to pinpoint things. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what, what, why that's why I'm. Yeah. It, it really is. It is a difficult, it kind of takes, you get really good at it. And I think anybody can do it. Yeah. It just takes a lot less time once you develop this instinct, mm -hmm. you know, so I don't want to make it feel, I don't, I don't want to make any listener feel like, Oh, well, I'm not good at walking around and identifying them. So I can't do this. No, you, you can still, a lot of people take pictures. You know, we've done podcast episodes recently. They'll take a picture, send it to a VA or take it home and, and study the brands and go through. And once you have the basic skills, you can find replants. They're, they're everywhere. But some people have that special gift instinct. And I always like hearing like, what is it that kind of got you there? I love that you say you worked for Shipped too. I've talked to a couple of people that actually, we have that up here as well. It's popular. And I see them often in our Myers stores around here. And there, uh, I've had the conversation, like, if you broke it down, what do you earn per hour is my kind of my opening. I'm just curious. And they think that I'm interested in maybe doing that work. And I'd like to hear from you, Laura, what your answer is to that too, by the way. I don't want to get that away from that. But I'm, I'm thinking they would make really good shoppers. We haven't actually hired one of them yet. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the right conversation with the right one who's kind of a go-getter with a good attitude could really turn into something pretty cool because of all the things that you've mentioned... Um, but the one guy I talked to said he was earning like, he said, oh, I'm earning 25, 30 bucks an hour. I don't want to do anything else. I'm like, well, that's not a good candidate. You know, I'm kind of waiting for that good candidate who's like, hey, give me work. I'll work. I want to help build something. Uh, so what was your experience with it? And, and when you kind of break it down? Yeah. So um, I, I did it very regularly. I, I was doing it full time. A lot of people that work for ship work part time. Mm -hmm. They, have, they might have a different experience with it, but um, I, I was making good money probably in that range. Um, and if you developed regular customers, you know, you earn tips as well. So it would be hard to hire somebody that was doing shipped full time for $15 an hour. It would be hard to pull them away from shipped. It'd be hard to find. So the ideal shipped candidate might be someone who's kind of this uh, part time side gig. Yeah. And, and you walked away from it pretty easily to do this. I mean, I, I'd imagine you you see a lot more potential here. I, I don't know if I walked away easily because I was making good money, but um, yeah. I'm, you know, we're making more money with Amazon for sure. So um, yeah. Yeah. it's, it's, it's exciting to own your own business too and have control over, you know, how much you can make and um, you know. Yeah. You, well, you have the potential to own the process instead of grinding to make, to yeah. maximize, yeah. right? Which, which is what you're starting to experience. You know, a, a couple months from now, you'll, you'll really feel that effect of we've got other people, they showed up, they're working. You know, I got to sleep in a little today, tweaked the system a little bit here and there. And the money's just the same as when I was grinding, yeah. right? And the money's even better because you get good people in place and the system just flows. So yeah, I completely understand, Laurie. It's a chance to own something versus just hustling for right. that, you know, 25, 30 an hour yeah. type feel. Uh, I love it. So I, I am. I do plan to get someone on our team that's a professional shopper at some point because I just think that they're, they're a great find. And I know people. I can't remember who it is that uses them. Maybe it was Carl Jacoby that was using uh, people who had you know, professional shopping. The shipped and there's a few other services that do right. the grocery delivery type thing. It's a good person to bring on the team. Uh, in, not even necessarily just as a researcher, but just as someone to get out and to hit the stores and efficiently. Right, because we pay a couple of people. We did the same thing you guys did for some neighborhood neighborhood folks that go shop our list. We have a shared spreadsheet, and they can go buy whatever's on that list anytime they want. And we'll reimburse them plus hours for their time. Um, I want to go back to something you said, though, Laura. I think some of the listeners we we went past it pretty quick, and they're going to be curious what you do when you're. You say you're in a store. 
What tools are you using to identify a good replan while you're there in real time to go, yep, this is a winner. Take us through that process. Like what are your metrics and what tools are you using? Yeah, I mean, we're pretty simple. We use Keepa um, and we have gotten, you know, we've just gotten pretty good at reading the charts and um, really studying the, the process and finding a good replan. Kate was excellent at teaching us and, you know, we just kind of, have honed our skills over the year. Um, so yeah, I, I use Keepa and Seller Central and Scoutify. the and Scoutify and um, the buying app, you know, Amazon buying app. So that's, that's it. Yeah, yeah, pretty simple process. But talk me through with a little, a little more specificity, if you would. So let's say you're looking at a product. Do you scan the barcode? Do you type in the name on Amazon? Like, what's your process in the store? Yeah. So um, and Keepa. We type in the name of the product um, that typically yields more results of listings. Um, and then I'll also go into the selling app and the buying app and, and see what listings get pulled up through those methods as well. Yeah, just the free Amazon buy app and sell app. Yep. Just like your customer. And then as your, you know, the, the seller central app, I guess is what we call the the, the seller's app, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And so that's that's our method. I mean, it's it's not heavily involved. I mean, I think everybody knows that those are available to you. Um, you just have to get good at reading the charts. And, yeah. So, know, the, so so what are your parameters? How many drops are you looking for on Keepa? And what yeah. price range do you guys play in? Um, we I tend to look for seven or more drops a month. Um, seven. That's a that's one of the lower numbers I've heard. Do you have some winners in that range? Mm-hmm. You guys both nodded your head pretty fast there. <laughs> yeah. There are smaller sellers, but more often than not, a lot of sellers skip over them. So you, you're probably one or two of the only FBA sellers on that listing. Um, so we, we just tested one that got six drops a month on Keepa, but we um, sold two, not in one transaction, but we sold two within a matter of a week. Um, so it, it's sometimes beneficial to be on those quieter listings because you're the only FBA seller on them. So we, yeah. we, don't, we don't pass up on the opportunity. It's not going to be a, a lights out product, but it's going to make us some money and it's easy to find. So we'll, we'll sell it. Yeah. yeah. It, We've also expanded kind of looking at like buy box statistics and, you know, on variation listings, getting better at reading the Keepa charts for those so that we don't make mistakes. Um, I think that's an easy mistake to make for new sellers is on variation listings that can be difficult to understand. Right. Um, so, you get fooled by the variation. You get all excited. Wow, 50 drops a month. Well, there's eight flavors and it's only the grape that's selling. <laughs> and you're getting excited about the strawberry and it doesn't sell. Yeah, so being able... Those are the kind of skills we teach to, to really help you you know, avoid picking the losers. But the nice thing about this business really is, maybe let's talk through a few of the losers that you guys have found. You don't lose your shirt with a losing product. And that's the difference between this model and private label. One of the big differences so I'm, I'm assuming you guys pick some losers. Oh yeah. So around sure. here, we just try some interesting food. You're like, all right, we we yeah. got a food pantry we donate to. Actually, people that work in our warehouse work at the church's food pantry as well, and we just have a shelf. It's like, yep, that's where the loser products go, you know. Yeah. But but it it's not a big hit. Talk me through that a little bit. Like, talk me through some of your losers. Um, yeah, I mean, we we've had plenty of losers. Um. And but using the the methods that obviously we were taught and that are taught in the the proven Amazon course, like they're proven for a reason. They work more often than they don't. So our, our losing percentage is pretty small. Um, but like you said, we don't lose our shirt on them. Um, at, at most, um, when we first started out, we were only testing probably three or four units of a test product um, at, at first. So you know you're thinking on a let's say an average of five dollar cost, you're you're only in fifteen twenty bucks, right? So it's it's not that bad of a, a test or an investment. Um, and then obviously they'll sell at a certain point. Um, if you read the, the keep a chart right, um, you just might not make any money on it. You might get your money back and it, it's almost a risk-free investment at that point. Um, we, we have since started testing a higher number of units in our initial test. So we, we've gone up to 12 units um, per test. Um, obviously, the keep a chart has to make sense and the units sold a month has to make sense. But um, we've just started going bigger and we've actually seen um, pretty good results in testing out um, in larger quantities, actually. Um, 
I guess the theory behind it, Rich talks about it a little bit, is that it gets to more fulfillment centers right. quickly um, yes. when, when the buy box in different areas. So um, as we had more capital built up, we feel um, more free to um, test out in larger quantities. You're a little bolder. Yeah. yeah. And, see, and see if, and here's a piece of it too, uh, when you're testing and you're buying a few more than maybe when you were new, my, my theory is it's safe, especially if we're talking about a, a product that has 20 or 30 or more drops on Keepa. At that point, you know, this is something that's selling pretty consistently. Like this, this thing moves. The worst case scenario is we're gonna have to drop our price right. and maybe lose 50 cents a unit or use, lose a couple dollars a unit is like the worst case scenario. So why not go ahead and test 10 or 20 instead of just three or four? When the worst case scenario is we're going to lose twenty, thirty dollars, you know, it's like come on. And the best case scenario is we could have just found a true winner, and we can test it and have our evidence very quickly right. with that many units. And like Rich Potter taught you guys, if you spread it out over multiple distribution centers, the buy box statistics, you know, go up significantly. Right. Your your odds of winning the buy box and making those sales quickly, um, which only makes sense. I think sometimes people think that the buy box on Amazon is the same for everybody across the country. It's, it's just not. It changes every five minutes for, for you, right where you're sitting in your state, but it's also different for everybody around the country at any given time because there may or may not be any products near you at any given time. And Amazon systems are really smart. So that's why sometimes one of some of our products, we're very bold in pricing some of our products. Like say there's eight or 10 other FBA sellers, we're fine being the highest priced FBA seller. Mm-hmm. We've got enough in there and we see those sales popping through because we're, we're the only one in a certain distribution center. We're going to get the sale at some point. So you can you can take your time and sell at high prices in this. Are you guys doing any of that? Like if you're in the mix with other FBA sellers, where do you tend to settle? Like what are your settings with the price? And I love getting into the weeds with you guys, by the way, because I know you're, you're giving great answers on all of this stuff. I think that that um, strategy for us has changed over time. We were one of those stupid sellers at the beginning where we would- We all like, are. You know, two cents below the lowest FBA seller. And you know, right. we, we were the ones killing listings. Um, <laughs> you guys were the ones. That was you. Yeah. Now we know who to send the hate yeah. mail to. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, no, we all do that at some point. You know, it's like, okay, I got to be the lowest price and get rid of these right. because I got too many. And, he, right. he, and the, everybody follows you down. Yeah. Right. But as your metrics change and improve, obviously, as you become a more experienced seller, you you know that you can price it a bit higher than even the lowest FBA seller to yeah. take advantage of your metrics and the number that you have in inventory across the nation. And yeah. so... Hey, Business Building Warrior, sorry for the quick interruption. Just wanted to make sure and remind you about our tremendous sponsor, Payoneer.com. If you need funding, up to $750,000, flexible repayment terms, no credit check. They love Amazon and Walmart sellers. They want to help you grow. Payoneer.com slash funding for 10% off the fees. Be sure to tell them we sent you. All right, let's get back to the show. Take advantage of your metrics and the number that you have in inventory across the nation. And yeah. so... Yeah, we, we don't necessarily have any like hard and fast rule on where we price our minimums at. Um, we like to use um, Keep a History on doing that. Um, so, you know, we're not going to go down to 50% ROI if it's never been, you know, lower than 75% ROI. I don't know why anyone would do that. You're missing out on, you know, 25% return on your initial investment. Mm-hmm. Um, so for each specific product, we, we go through and, and look at, you know, the Keep History, um, where it's sold in the past, and we won't go lower than our minimums, um, as well as same with the maximums. Obviously, if it's selling for and it's shown history of selling for you know three four dollars above what the current buy box is, and it, it bounces. We're going to catch the higher price, um, and that's where we're going to set our price at. Mm-hmm. Um, just because we don't want to lose you know two three dollars on a sale when it's still selling for that higher price point, we want to catch the upswing. And so many sellers miss out on that and are crushing their profits because they want to just win the buy box and sell out faster. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you can make more money, just being a little bit more patient and selling at a higher price point, uh, you know, volume isn't everything. Making more money is what the goal of business is. So if you can maximize your dollars and maximize your profit, that should be your end goal instead of just moving units. So that's how we price things. It's not a, a set rule. It's a per, per skew basis. Well said. 
and you guys are using a repricer. So who's the one, I get the feeling that Colin, you're the one that kind of keeps an eye on that. Yeah. Is that true? Okay. So how much time do you spend? Like what's your target? You said four, 500. Yeah. And and how do you do it? Talk me through, you know, what we do is we sort our inventory from what do we have the most of right now? And we work from the top down. Yeah. So we're not missing out on any of the big, big issues or big opportunities, right? So, but how do you tackle it and how much time do you spend on it? Give you a day or week. Yeah. So, so I address it once a week. Um, obviously if we add new products in a shipment, I try to, you know, get the mins and maxes put in the next day, just because depending on the fulfillment center it's going to, it could hit inventory within a matter of, you know, 48 hours sometimes. So um, right. we don't want to miss out on, on those upswings or we don't want to get crushed on, um, you know, the buy box just crashing. Um, so there, there's no like set answer on this, but I, I typically spend about half a day on Thursday to go through um, our repricer. Um, obviously, like you said, we start out with the ones that we have more units and in inventory on and okay, why aren't those selling as fast as others? Um, and maybe, you know, I made a mistake on our, our minimum or maybe I forgot to turn on repricing. I don't know. Um, or if the, the buy box is kind of crashing, okay, is it going to come back up? Is this historical where this happens? It crashes and comes back up. Um, it, it's really a, a per per skew basis that you go in and analyze it um, and see what your strategy strategy should be either hold or, you know, liquidate it as quick as possible and don't ever touch it again. Um, but, you know, Aura has some powerful tools in to, you know, helping you not spend so much time on that. We've started to utilize the, the workflows um, on Aura to help automate some pricing um, just because we we've, long heard, you know, rumors of like, basically when you change the price, just a cent, you know, up or down for whatever reason, Amazon will reward you for that. So I used to go through yeah. and kind of play with each one of our, our skews. Right. You can automate that. Which... You can turn on that little wiggle and yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I haven't seen the factual scientific data on it, but people swear by it and yeah, <laughs> wiggle your prices every now and then if something's not moving. Wiggling yeah. around a little bit. It's crazy. It's yeah. like Amazon rewards you for paying attention to your account. Right. Getting yeah. in there and playing around. It, I, yeah. I and mean, I find that even just like when you're sourcing and you look at a listing, yeah. and then like 10 minutes later, you make a sale on that product. Yeah. It's so weird. <laughs> right. I wonder how much that's psychological and how much that's like scientific. But yeah. yeah. No, it, it, it there's is. enough evidence out there. If you're if you're in there planning your account, better things happen. If you ignore it for a few days, it it seems to stagnate. Right? Yeah, yeah. One one other thing I use um, when I'm doing the repricer is um, on Seller Central. It it has like suggestions on like uh, maybe you know change your price on this. It hasn't sold in a while, so you know if something hasn't moved in 90 days, I'll I'll typically just try to get rid of it. Um, or if something hasn't moved for like 30 to 60 days, I'll try to change the repricer a little bit. Uh, but again, it's just a case by case basis as to you know what's going on um, right. and what historically has happened. Um, obviously, yeah. it's not a perfect indicator of what's going to happen, uh, sure. but more often than not, it it is. So um, that that's another way I check you know slower moving products. Yeah, and and there's no perfect rules because at any given time, someone can come around, come along foolishly and think they're making money when they're not and tank anything. Yeah. But that that's the game. But that's why we have hundreds of. Yep. products at any given time. And, and those ones that always surprise us, we've got one right now, we're the only seller, yep. FBA or FBM, the only person. And it's in every Walmart in the country. It's in every Meyer in the country. It's in every Kroger in the country. <laughs> and we're the only one for yep. quite a while now that's selling at FBA and FBM at a really attractive margin. Those, those, and I never suspected it would be as hot as it is, but you, know, you see the orders popping through about one or two a day, a great margin. Like that, those things are out there. You just have to learn how to find them. And if you find hundreds of them, you've got a great business and you can have mom and dad working for you and, and have this beautiful arrangement. Uh, and you, and we really dove into the weeds more today. Sometimes this, podcast takes on like, Hey, let's tell the story. And how does everybody feel about it? And today we kind of drove into the weeds on the technical side a little bit, but I loved it, you know, and I'm learning as we go too. So I'm really enjoying that, but I want to hear more of whatever's on your guys' minds, advice for new sellers or the family dynamics of all of you guys working together is really cool. Like if you had to learn some interesting lessons there, you know, what else do you guys want to talk about? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things, you know, in working together is, 
we've all just kind of naturally specialized in what we're good at or what we're attracted to, um, the tasks that we are attracted to. And um, I think that has made us very efficient in, in, in our workplace. Um, like Mike, my husband handles all, all like he manages our accountant and all the finances and he's very analytical. And so he does a lot of the analysis for us. Like, you know, we'll shoot him a text and say, Hey, analyze this for us. Yeah. Or, and he loves that. Yeah. Um, Tristan's great at packing. So she helps to pack in the warehouse and she packs those boxes. Awesome. Um, and she's I, like the organizer. Yeah. I yeah. Take it. My wife. Yeah. 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 Um, and Colin's great on the computer stuff and, you know, just working quickly on, you know, with the Amazon account and dealing with all that. And my specialty is probably more in the shopping, sourcing and managing the warehouse and organization. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we all kind of do what we love and, and yeah. that has worked really beautifully for us. Yeah. It, I mean, at the beginning, it wasn't as easy. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> sure. You're in a process. You can be at each other's throats every once in a while. It's like, okay, we're family at the end of the day. And that's what is most important. Like throw this business away. Family is what's going to continue on. So that's um, nothing is, you know, uh, jeopardizing relationships for, and we we've had to learn, you know, how do we not step on each other's toes? Because being completely honest, I think we're both pretty type A and we like <laughs> things our way. Um, so, you know, in the transition of going from private label to replants, I had to learn how to give control over um, to my mom in some areas. And then she had to learn to trust me in some areas. And um, that wasn't a, a, you know, we had never done that before. So it was, we were trying to navigate as we go, as we're, you know, growing at like an almost unsustainable rate. And it's like, how do we do both of those at the same time? Um, but we've come to a really good place where, you know, we, we just trust each other. Like, you know, the, the warehouse is her thing. I, I like whatever she tells me to do, I'm fine doing that. And, and even though like, I think I'm running the company, she is just as in charge as I am. And, you know, with, you know, us moving into more wholesale stuff and me doing all the like technical stuff behind the, the scenes, she trusts me and that I, I have the best interest of the company, um, you know, in, in mind. So it's just a trust thing, you know, knowing that no one's trying to hurt the other one or not you know, we, we both want things done and we want a successful company at the end of the day. So it's just a little bit of compromise and learning, you know, what are each other's strengths and mm -hmm. playing into those and letting that person play into those instead of telling them how to, you know, play with their strength, I guess. Yeah. You, what's it like as a, as a mom? And this is a question I got to ask my mom at one point, cause, cause she works with me, you know, we're, we're in a, a, a different age demographic, but that's about it. Like it's my business, but she works for me and I, I turn stuff over to her and she just handles it. And like, let me know when you need me, trust in you with that. It's really phenomenal. And I know it's, you know, some of the things she says, and I know the part she enjoys is it's just, we're doing stuff together and it's meaningful, significant stuff. And yeah, we're making a profit, but the relationship benefits. It says a mom, you know, hit that question for a topic. Like what's the dynamic impact on your family relationally? I mean, I, I think it's really cool to see your kid having started a business and to see how quickly it has grown and flourished into something really awesome. Um, and Colin's always had this entrepreneurial spirit. So I, I, I knew that he would always do something unique and he wouldn't have the traditional corporate job. Um, so it's, it's cool to see kind of his personality play out into this and his dream come to fruition. Um, so that part is really cool. And the dynamics, like, like we're always together and like what more could a mom want than to have your family close by and, you know, doing something that's meaningful together. But like Colin said, like relationship is, is always the priority. And so if, you know, if there's conflict in that, that gets addressed first as over anything with the business. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great to have Colin and Tristan close to us and working together side by side on a daily basis. And, um, it just adds to the richness of your relationship with your children. Really? Yeah, because yeah. I know some people are hesitant or resistant to the concept, and I just I don't see it. I keep meeting these families that are doing it together, and you know I've heard that rule of thumb like, oh, never hire family. Like, no, I'm not sure I, I agree with that. I actually wholeheartedly disagree with it. If you've got a good family, who better to spend time with? 
Yeah. And who better to strengthen relationships with? And the grind of building a business sharpens and improves those relationships time and time and time again. You guys are just the latest example mm-hmm. of exactly that. So I, I love diving into that. Uh, it's actually, there's a, there's a biblical model there too of that we were encouraged, you know, build something significant with family is, is a theme. And I won't dive off in that direction, but I just keep meeting all these families that are, they're better off for having done business under the same roof. And I take it you guys live close. You're not all living in the same house, are you? Or is it, did you live close or? Um, so we, we actually just moved up to Indianapolis. Um, you and, live in Indianapolis? Yeah, what? Westfield. Yeah, Westfield. Well, okay, I knew that and I'd forgotten. For some reason, I'm yeah. thinking I'm talking to people in Florida. All right. Well, that, that, we literally just moved up um, a couple months ago. two months ago. Um, all of you? Yeah, so, well, so my parents had a house here um, in Westfield, um, gotcha. also down in Florida as well. Um, but my wife and I um, talked to my other siblings and we're like, hey, like we, we'd love to raise our family in the Midwest. Um, that's just, I grew up in Chicago and I know how the Midwest rolls and the values that are, are here and, you know, instilled in, in, you know, kids at a young age. Um, and that's not necessarily a case where we were in Florida. So, um, you know, we kind of got everyone on board and, um, our house was supposed to be done a lot sooner than it's planning out to be. So I'm living in mommy's house for the time being, which is wonderful. Dude, that's awesome. Okay. I didn't know this part of the story at all. So we're neighbors. How cool is that? We got to get yeah. together, man. So you guys yeah. around India a little bit, although mom and dad know Indy very well. How long have you guys been here? Uh, 2017. So not long. Um, oh, okay. You're still kind of new to the area. Yeah. Um, yeah still figuring kinda- it out. Yeah. Well, that's, we got to, we got to hang out sometime. I didn't realize you guys were just over in Westfield. That's tremendous. I mean, we, you know, we could meet downtown in half an hour. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah, that's well, awesome. that's awesome. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but real quick on the move, I, I thought this might be interesting. So we, we thought the move was going to impact our business. You know, mm-hmm. obviously we're going to lose all these replans that we had at, at Publix, right? So all the regional, you know, you know, excuse that we had. Um, but we, we moved up here and we, we've had two of our best months back to back, um, since moving here. Um, whether, whether that might be the the case of living together for the time being, or, um, you know, we, we just decide to really, you know, dive into it, um, even harder because we knew we had to catch right. up. I don't know necessarily what the, the reason for that result is, but, um, you know, this business allows you to move around. And, and like my mom said, you can go on vacation for a week and Amazon's still dealing with fulfilling your orders and right. customer service. And that, that's a great thing about, about selling on Amazon that we, we love so much. Like when we went out to Rich's um, workshop, we had some of our best days of sales out there and we weren't even working. Yeah. We were learning. <laughs> You're sitting there learning. Yeah. It, yeah. it was wonderful. And that's, you know, that's where it starts to, to ring again some exciting advice that I start to give and you know, the position you guys are in is you start doing the things that only you can do. You start chipping away at those pieces where, you know, if we paid someone 10, 12, 15 bucks an hour, we wouldn't have to do this anymore. It starts making a lot of sense. And you chip through that list and suddenly you're left with not much left that only you can do. There's parts that you like doing, but for the good of the business, you're better off working on the business instead of being in the grind. Right. And then you become leaders in our community. You start doing some coaching. You become our next rich and Shelly Potter. And, you know, we're doing events here in Indy together, training other people how to do this stuff, having fun teaching and training and, or whatever your passion area of passion is, kind of springboarding off the success of your business. Because the reality is, and you guys know this, but I'm just, you know, talking to the listeners and, and reminding all of us that 99.9% of the world, when you say, hey, you know what, you could have a successful business from home working out of your garage sell a million bucks. And we need to talk about your margin, by the way, but we haven't done that yet. But you could put some great money in the bank, work and flexible. They're like, no, that's that's a pipe dream. That, that, that stuff doesn't really work. Well, we need people educating, telling that story, sharing. We need more leaders, we need more coaches because this stuff is starting to catch on and the world is starting to wake up like, hey, I don't know if I want to go do the nine to five anymore. I might want to be home with my kids, actually. I don't know if I want them going off and into some of this crazy stuff they're, they're learning over there. And you know, families are starting to kind of gather under their own roofs and build things. This is an explosive, you know, th- this was crazy st- talk 15 years ago. And now it's kind of like, we're more mainstream. <laughs> like, okay, work from home, make some decent money, keep the kids around. Like all the stuff that used to be nuts is kind of like mainstream now. So I'd love to see you guys make that transition and that journey into 
like some kind of leadership education role, if it's of interest, yeah. you know, we're always looking and recruiting. Yeah. Yeah. We actually, I mean, I, I have friends all the time ask me, um, Hey, teach me what you do. Yeah. And they, they obviously think it's easier than, um, Oh, it's work. Yeah. It, you have to grind. Right. And yep. one of my, my best friends actually, you know, asked me to teach him. So, um, that's something I like doing. Obviously, like they sent us their first sale and we were just as pumped as they were. Like, it was so exciting yeah. to see it. Cause you know, like you said, like it, we're changing lives at the end of the day, it, even though it's so small or it seems so small. Uh, when we took Kate's class, I'm sure she didn't think, um, you know, teaching us for four weeks or six weeks or whatever it was, was going to change our lives significantly. And it did. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just, you know, something that I, I think we're both passionate about is, you know, helping, um, people find what they're passionate about and, you know, attack it. And obviously we like Amazon, so do it through Amazon, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's truly an awesome, awesome gig that we have and um, being able to do as a family. And uh, I mean, my wife and I are able to to pay for a house in this area and not that materialistic things are what it's all about, but I'm able to provide my family with a like nice living um, in just one year of doing this. Um, so it is possible and it just takes work to get there. So it is really exciting. And, and I just encourage you, Colin, and, and for anyone else too, like this, this really is just the start. Yep. Selling physical products, FBA to people you probably never meet, you know, that's a model that really, really works, but it's just the start of the possibilities. Like you just said, you'll, plenty of people are going to notice when you're succeeding and go, is there something yeah, I could learn from this person? It, it, we've we've built a nice platform to operate on where, yeah, there's a lot of people that need a lot of help. And you guys, you know, what I love is like, let's say we have another live event here, you know, whatever point in the future and you guys are there, you're going to have people come up to you and say, that was the episode, that conversation. My mom and I now work together. You know, Um, before we'd always thought, oh, family shouldn't do this together, you know, but that you changed our mind or some other part of your story that you don't see coming. Like it's going to impact a lot of people just doing this. It's contagious. Because uh, once you attach relationship to your business, that's when it gets really exciting. And, and like you said, Colin, you feel like you're changing lives and helping people. That's why I've loved what I get to do for, you know, come up in 20 years, man. Walked away from a great sales job. I was very nervous initially for sure, but 20 years in, it just never gets old. Uh, getting, to, getting to hang out and talk with people like you guys and, and just on a regular basis, you know, the story kind of rippling out, new leaders emerging. So it's been awesome hanging out with you guys. Yeah. So we we need to talk margin. I don't want to skip that part because that's actually a requirement. When we talk numbers, we got to say, okay, here's what we're actually putting in the bank. So talk us through that just a little bit. Yeah. So um, our, our typical um, gross uh, margin is around 26%. Um, we just recently restructured, or at the beginning of this year, not super recently, uh, we restructured to an S-corp. So uh, we started paying ourselves a salary. Um just for some tax benefits, I guess. Um, and then, so our, our gross profit, um, on average is, um, ranging around 19 to 20%. So it's, um, been really, really good. Um, obviously people at home can do math on on a million dollars at at those numbers. Yeah. Um, It's a pretty good, pretty good living for not have hiring anyone up until last week. Yeah. Um, Oh, for sure. And then obviously working from home. Exactly. And flexible. um, yeah, I, I get to do this with the people I love and I get paid to do that. That's, that sounds like robbery. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's not it's, supposed to be this easy. That's not what they taught me in school. <laughs> right? Yeah, they didn't teach me any of this in school. So uh, right. if anything, well, I'm writing a book, Colin, I've mentioned it a few times and I, I got to get it done because it just, I keep adding to the list. Actually, I just can't finish this thing, but it's all the things I had to unlearn from my traditional education, public education in order to succeed in the real world. Like it, the list keeps growing, man. It's just, there's so many misconceptions and, you know, let's start with profit is evil. Like, I mean, that's one of like good luck in business or in life at all, you know, like, so you're going to go work for an evil company that makes a profit. <laughs> if, if, if profit's evil, like you got to get that out of your head, you know, there's, and that's, and that's just one of the more obvious ones. There's so many of them. And I find myself still unlearning and uh, our kids have benefited tremendously from never having to unlearn unlearn a lot of those because we homeschool. <laughs> like they avoided, I love some of the questions they asked me. It's like, wait, you never had that false assumption and had to unlearn it. This is great. Yeah. Uh, so they, they've benefited tremendously. But 
uh, yeah, you guys are on a beautiful path doing life together with your family right there here in, in beautiful central Indiana. Right. We got to go catch a Pacers game or something together, man, sometime. That'd be just awesome. I'd love to hang out with you guys and and I get to know you a little bit better. But it, what are we leaving out of the story? Anything else, guys? Any encouragement for the listeners or any final thoughts? Anything you wanted to hit that we didn't? Um, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think to touch on your last point about like profit being bad, we were actually just talking about this the other day. Like I, I had to teach some of my friends, like they're like, oh, you're price gouging. That's so like not right of you. And I'm like, you guys use Uber Eats, right? Or yeah. like, what, what's the difference? They charge a premium right. for a service. And, and that's how we look at our business. We're, we're providing people and connecting people with products that they either don't want to go to the store for, or they can't find it. Find it. Convenience. Um, and they're, yeah, they're paying for convenience. So we are Uber Eats just on Amazon. Um, obviously, we're not selling warm food or just food, but you, like you get what my point is, it's it's a service that we're providing and it's okay to, to be profitable um, because you know you, your success creates other people's success. Like we're able to pay um, these stay-at-home moms now. Um, and then down the line, we're hopefully adding on full-time employees. Like you're creating success from your success. And that's the goal at the end of the day is to bless the people around you. So that's there's nothing right. wrong with earning a profit. It's, yeah. Not only is there nothing wrong with it, I, one of my favorite quotes from a mentor of mine, Daniel Lappin, he says, it is impossible to operate a business profitably without significantly improving the lives of innumerable people around you. Yeah. Zero negative effect on anybody. Yeah. And tremendous positive effect on virtually everybody that it touches the, the people who make the stuff you know um mm -hmm. i love the, the the hebrew tradition you know their mealtime prayer i don't remember how exactly how it goes but when they sit down to eat they pray before and after they eat but the prayer before they eat is just recognizing that on the table in front of them represents countless people who had different talents in different businesses, in different industries. And, you know, think about it sometime, like how many people put a, some effort into just your average meal sitting around okay. a table, like the table itself, the salt shaker, the, the, the person who designed the salt shaker a long time ago. I mean, just, you can get so intricate. It's tens of thousands of people that had to cooperate in some fashion to bring that. And it's recognizing like, thank God for all the different talents and, and, and abilities and needs of all these different people that allowed this to kind of come together and, um, is it is pretty phenomenal. So it's it's a mindset shift. Not only is profit not evil, it's a sign that someone's doing a whole lot of good for a whole lot of people. And it, yeah, if and if you struggle with that, man, you're going to struggle to ever achieve anything significant in, in business or life. I would argue, but yeah, great mindset, man. We need more people like you in your age bracket. You know, <laughs> there it's a it, it's a it's a battle for sure. Uh, right now in our culture. And that's why sometimes I see this as something so much bigger than just teaching people how to make money. Um, it's, it's, we're doing cultural battle, really. It's what I see it as. But well, God bless you guys. It's been really cool hanging out with you. Really, really good time. Let me talk to the listeners for just a second before we wrap this up. Unless you've got anything else, mom, I don't want to cut you off. No, I'm good. good. Okay. So for the listeners, I hope you enjoyed hanging out with these guys as much as I did. I've got some really cool new neighbors. I bet you're a little jealous, actually, because we're going to be hanging out. I have a feeling of getting to know each other a little bit. But it's been really cool hanging out with them and you. Thanks for volunteering some of your time today to hang out. The one thing we do ask in return, if you got some value out of this conversation today, is send some people to silentgym.com. Go tell them, hey, check out a few of these episodes. Good stuff, encouraging stuff. Help you make a little extra money, get encouraged. Uh, get your mindset right about business and money. That's what we do around here with ideas that just flat out work as evidenced by dozens and dozens and dozens of interviews like this of real people doing life and doing business together. A lot of us talking about Amazon and a whole lot of other things, but we are still very bullish on Amazon. There's a huge opportunity there. Many, many more people can jump into this. I'm thinking tens of thousands without even putting a dent in the opportunity because it's just growing so fast. And we're the place to learn it as evidenced by, again, all these success stories. So thanks for hanging out with us, though. We really appreciate that. Until next time, God bless all the business building warriors out there. We're in your corner. We're here for you. We love supporting you. Hey, jump over and join our free Facebook group too, if you're not there yet. That's a good last tip to end on. The link is at silentgym.com. All the resources we talked about today too, same thing. All right, talk to you again soon. God bless. Hey, before I go, one last reminder, payoneer.com a tremendous sponsor of this show. 
you can get 10% off your first fees by going to payoneer.com slash funding. Tell them you came from our program. They're going to take good care of you. Up to $750,000 for Amazon and Walmart sellers. Hey, if you're needing some funding with some good flexible payback terms with no credit check, you're going to love these guys. Go check them out. <laughs> 